I've always been interested in the relationship between uh, religion and art, maybe because I, I studied at the Catholic University in Milan before doing my PhD in the States, and I had to take theology and art history together, and so I became interested in the interpretation and the iconographical aspect of sacred art. And this has accompanied me through my work, academic work, and my PhD dissertation was about the iconography of the Immaculate Conception in the Renaissance. And that's when I stumbled on Piero's uh, Tedaldi altarpiece. Uh, actually, I knew him already before because everybody remembers Vasari's story about uh, boiling 50 eggs at the beginning of the week and leaving of that. And, um, and I knew some of his most important paintings. But um, studying his religious work with more attention probably started more or less at the time of uh, my uh, dissertation. And then it, I never stopped thinking about it every now and then. And then when I was asked by the staff of the National Gallery to take part to the study day on occasion of the exhibition in Washington, I think that somehow an old uh, uh, primo amore came back somehow. I think we can try to just say a few things in order to understand why Piero di Cosimo is interesting. His way of representing Mary becomes so uh, interesting because it's peculiar. Um, Mary has always been one of the most, maybe the most represented figure in Christian art. Uh, but uh, in the very first centuries, uh, so uh, third, second, third century after Christ, we, she's always subordinated to the figure of Christ, of course, because it was theological, it was this way. Um, slowly but steadily, the cult of Mary, so people's devotion to Mary has started increasing and becoming stronger and stronger. And the iconography and representing her, the urge of representing her, just follows the same, uh, is part of this process, is part of this phenomenon. So more or less, you probably, see, everybody knows, but so she was proclaimed, acknowledged to be officially the Theotokos, the real and divine mother of God, at Nephesus in 1431. And um, more or less from the fourth, fifth century, we start having representation of Marys who are more and more um, independent. I mean, she's still presented as Theotokos, so as the mother of child, she carries the child, but she becomes a monumental, uh, uh, individual, an important figure. And this goes on and becomes uh, stronger, this, uh, this uh, trend and uh, achieves a turning point, I would say, after the year 1000 or so in the 11th, 12th century, when we have the monastic orders promoting the cult of Mary even stronger. Why so? Because uh, the monastic orders focus their spirituality on the Christ as a man and the suffering for saving us. And of course, then Mary becomes a crucial part of this project because he became man thanks to his mother. And she followed him until at the foot of the cross. And that's when we basically, anthropologically, we all need a figure of the mother helping us or interceding for us to the father. And I think the medical order somehow found this as a perfect way of addressing people. So true Mary was really one of the strongest things. And so she, the representations of Mary starting become more frequent and more varied. So we, we start having on the 13th, 14th century, not only the typical Theotokos, Mary carrying the child, or Hodigidria, so Mary carrying the child, having a, finally a nimbus behind her. This was already in the fourth century. 
in the 6th century we would have her already portrayed as a queen, but then in the late Middle Ages we start having the Madonna della Misericordia, Madonna of Humility, so she, she has the mantle open and people are finding protection under uh, below her mantle, that's Misericordia, Madonna dell'Umiltà, she's standing on the floor because floor is humus, so she's attached to the floor, she's one of us, but she's better than every of us, each of us. And uh, Madonna Lactans, so a very human way of portraying her because she's nursing her child. And this goes on until the Renaissance, where at the same time all these different ways of representing her achieve also from a stylistic point of view a naturalism, which was unprecedented. And then that's where Piero comes and all the, the Renaissance uh, painters who start representing Mary in different ways and in, a, in ways in which she's somehow closer to us. She's a beautiful woman, but she's one of us. She's not just a faraway icon. And she can be represented in different scenes of her life. Um, but that's when, in Florence, we start having a special way of representing Mary, which is this courtly beauty which we know through Botticelli, so beautiful Mary with blonde hair, with tresses, complicated hairdos and pearls and transparent um, uh, veils. Uh, this is re related to a vernacular culture, going back to Petrarchismo, which wants the female beauty, no matter whether she's Venus or Mary, uh, with golden hair and ivory complexion, rosy cheeks and beautiful lips and per pearly teeth. And that's the way Mary was represented in the second half of the 15th century in Florence from Botticelli, Filippo Lippo, Filippino. And Piero is one of them, is a contemporary and he just does another way of, uh, choose another way of representing Mary and she's just uh, a girl a simple girl, it's a simple beauty, uh, she's r rarely blonde, more frequently a brunette, she's not wearing complicated hairdos, generally the hair are covered with a thick veil, even when it's transparent it doesn't really have the, the refined decoration which Botticelli would do. She wears another kind of dress, generally it's the veste shoulder, so the dress is not doesn't underline the waistline, it just follows like that, so it's not particularly feminine, it's really the dress of a woman who has just given birth to a child. And, um, and so it becomes really a, an outsider in the way of representing Mary. It's, it's a different Mary from the ones of his contemporaries. It's, uh, I, I wrote that um, it's an Ancilla Donmini, so it's the maiden of the god, god more than a queen. Botticelli's Madonna are queens. And uh, I think Piero chose to, to, to paint uh, the handmaiden of the god. I think that the portrait we, we receive from Vasari's Vita, the portrait of Piero, I like to think that it's rather accurate as a personality. After all, Vasari actually didn't rely on a written tradition, as Alessandro Nova has brilliantly explained in his essay on the Florence exhibition catalog. He had oral, he, testimonies. He spoke to Andrea del Sarto, who used to work at the Bottega of Piero, to Francesco da uh, Sangallo, to the son of Cosimo Rosselli, where Piero worked part of his, uh, he had his apprenticeship and Cosimo was his beloved master. So I think the personality, he portraits of this uh, crazy man, um, uh, fascinated by nature, uh, independent in his way of looking and uh, no, of, of living and of painting, I think it, it's probably an accurate one. Um, on the other hand, um, and that's why probably Piero did enjoy commission, because I, I'm not sure whether Piero decided by himself to portrait uh, scenes from uh, Lucretius uh, in the way he did. He must have had or may have very well had, had a patron who was interested in the subject and I'm sure that Peter enjoyed fulfilling the commission the best and the wittiest possible way. 
but uh, this is not necessarily both for the patron commissioning this or for the painter executing it's not necessarily contradictory with the fact that Pietro Piero or maybe his patron would also go to church and be very zealous very devout um, first of all we all have uh, 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 split personalities we, we may laugh, like different things and then uh, I think you have to keep in mind the ambivalent and sometimes contradictory attitude of uh, humanism, Florentine humanism, Renaissance humanism in relation to the uh, text of classic antiquity. So they are fascinated by this treasure trove of new sources coming back and being rediscovered and very frequently being uh, pretty much uh, heterodox. And on the other hand, they, uh, they try to, to put it together uh, with uh, their religious belief, with Christianity. The whole uh, um, enterprise of Florentine humanism is to find a way of, uh, to reconcile the tradition, the classical tradition in all its aspects and uh, their living tradition of the Christian religion. And especially about uh, uh, Lucretius uh, with his uh, De Rerum Natura, which was rediscovered by Poggio Bracciolini in Fulda in a monastery in uh, 1417. Uh, um, uh, Lucretius is scandalous, is scandalous in his De Rerum Natura. Uh, Lucretius' master, his model, is Epicuro. The whole idea of Epicuro, and which we read them. Um, between the line of the rerum natura is that gods don't care about the human being. We may as well be responsible of what we do of our lives. There is no help from above. And uh, the, the real goal of our life is pleasure. No? But pleasure is not to be understood as this pure hedonism or you know, erotic or whatever. Pleasure is, according to Epicuro, living in the most advantageous way for for us. And uh, um, people were trying sometimes to put this together with Christian religion. And one of them was Lorenzo Valla, a famous uh, you know, Florentine humanist, theologian, philosopher. And when he was in Pavia in the 30s of the 15th century, he did write De Voluptate, which is a treatise in which he exactly tries to reconcile the Epicurean way of looking at the world with Christian religion, just saying, um, after all, the utmost pleasure, we do have to look for pleasure, and the utmost pleasure is searching for God, believing in God, because after all, this is advantage, ad advantageous for us. This was scandalous enough. He, Leonardo Valla had to leave University of Pavia after <laughs> writing this, this work, but this shows you that uh, it was really possible that this, it was an ambivalent position, intellectual position of uh, the humanistic milieu in Italy and in Florence towards these uh, sources, which, have, which were fascinating, interesting, scandalous, and, but which they were trying to incorporate in their Christian life, more or less with success. And Epicuro, by the way, is portrayed by Raphael in the School of Athens. So this is also tells you that somehow they were also trying to put it in, in a very official position in the Vatican Palace, hidden among other philosophers, but he is there. The Filipinos paintings, which probably is just a couple of years earlier than the one of Piero, um, shows an iconography uh, which is relatively frequent in, uh, in Florence in the second half of the 15th century, also later on. Uh, you can think about the Madonna del Libro at the Paul di Pezzoli by Botticelli. Uh, in some cases, for instance, uh, in, um, uh, in the, the same, uh, in a painting by Raphael with the same subject, we were able to read the text of the book. And the text is uh, Libro d'Ore, is on the Ora Nona, which is uh, uh, that part of the liturgy of the day in which you pray thinking about the passion and death of Christ. So we may assume that uh, in itself the iconography of the Madonna and Child with the Book in most cases refers 
to a med meditation on the future of Christ. She is carrying her child, but they both know what's going to happen. And so I think um, mm, while Filipino's painting is beautiful, but it's again this beautiful woman with this courtly, courtly beauty. Um, she looks like a princess and she has this very frivolous uh, uh, knotted uh, ribbon uh, uh, which underlines as waist. Uh, so this is more or less uh, in the perfect Florentine tradition about which we were speaking before. Um, and Piero uh, seems to look and borrow mod Filipino's model, the invention, the composition, but somehow looks like that he understood the, the depth of the message, this liturgical message of that it's really, we are speaking about the passion of Christ because everything is much more said, the, the palette of the painting is much more said. Uh, the background is not a city anymore, it's just a very sad looking background with a uh, kind of um, uh, thunderstorm approaching. And you think about the earthquake, in the Gospel we read that when Christ dies there is a earthquake. Um, and uh, the, the way that the, the, uh, the colors of the ver uh, virgin's dress uh, in Filipino they are the typical red and blue and uh, Piero's colors are very very strange. Uh, they are mauve and uh, green, petrol green, so a very subdued palette. He has taken away this beautiful ribbon it's, and uh, she's wearing a vest a shawl and it all looks very very simple, very austere, kind of this male sad looking atmosphere. In the first, uh, in the foreground, you have the grapes, the cut, peaches cut in half. They really remind us of the sacrifice of the Eucharist. So I think this is a perfect case in which you, you see that Piero is thinking quite deeply about the meaning of the subject and he likes to borrow the iconograph iconographical tradition of the time, but then he also feels free to reinterpret it in a way which for him is probably much more coherent to the message of the painting, which is a sad message is a, or a happy one if you think that he will die for the resurrection, but he will go through, through the passion. We know that he was a peculiar person. We know that he liked, both in his profane and religious painting, to dare new things. After all, just choosing this kind of female beauty is daring in itself. As you were saying, it, he, he could have risked getting less commission because he was less beautiful or less elegant, but evidently he didn't care. Um, because, already because we know that sometimes even in the landscape he plays with shapes so that they get kind of anthropomorphic. So if any painter may have uh, made an experiment uh, like shaping the opening in the form of a heart, hinting to the fact that the heart of Mary is going to suffer because of the passion, this could, be, could have been uh, Piero. Uh, as I was saying, the, 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 the il culto, the cult of the Mater Dolorosa, so Mary suffering, is, goes back to the 13th century. It actually starts in Florence with the Servites. So the Servi di Maria really start around the uh, uh, devotion for the suffering Mary. Uh, it's only later on in the 16th century that this devotion iconographically was represented by Mary with her harsh shown. Yeah on her breast with many swords. This comes back, goes back to uh, um, uh, the Gospel of Luke where uh, uh, somebody tells uh, uh, Mary, uh, this young uh, child of yours will uh, make your heart uh, bleeding with like, if it were picked by a sword because you're going to suffer because of him, but he's going to do great things for, for mankind. Uh, so, uh, the iconography of the Madre Dolorosa, which we know is later than Piero. And I'm not saying that late Piero is thinking about something which didn't exist yet. But I think that uh, if somebody had the idea, uh, ante literum, of opening, uh, uh, of creating an opening in her breast, in her dress, to show this, this uh, heart which is going to suffer, could be Piero. 
I'm not saying that I'm not 100% <laughs> secure about that, but I, I think it's kind of difficult to believe that it's totally casual. It's red. It's an opening which has that shape and it's of a bright red in a very otherwise uh, subdued palette of the painting again. So it really stri strikes you when you look at it. Piero is such a strange and inventive artist. And we know from Vasari, and this is so perfectly fitting, that he was so closely obsessed by the study of nature, wild nature. He didn't want to, uh, that his uh, garden would be, you know, uh, kind of, he was, we must imagine it as a jungle. He just would not cut anything. He wouldn't want the house to be clean. So kind of wild way of life, but fascinating. Fa he was fascinated from, from nature. And we know that he loved animals. We'll see in so many paintings by him. So if there is one painter who may have painted a caterpillar knowing how it would develop, not in a butterfly, but in that strange kind of moth, it must be Piero. So, and in this case, I think we, we, it is legitimate to think that then it all must mean something, because this, this caterpillar is really threatened. I mean, it's going to be swollen up soon by that dark-looking, unpleasant bird. So if the caterpillar has, could have a Christological component, and you told me that there are some precedents uh, in, the, in the patristics in which, I mean, uh, uh, the, 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 the brook or the worm is compared to, 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 to Christ. Why not? It, this is a possible way of, of interpreting, of interpreting in a way, a, a very curious part of a very peculiar painting in which it seems strange to think that everything has been just put there uh, randomly uh, because uh, he likes plants, mushrooms, and caterpillars. It doesn't look uh, um, convincing to me. I think it's much more intriguing to think that uh, that caterpillar may mean something. Mm, and the fact that it's soon going to be swollen up by an unpleasant black figure uh, being death, uh, sin, whatever, uh, it's kind of uh, convincing, fascinating, or intriguing, whatever. So it's not sure it's 100% this way, but uh, I think we could think about it uh, with interest. <laughs>